up here in Brisbane and I studied medicine. Later, I became a specialist emergency physician, dealing with illness and trauma at the very pointy end. As a young emergency doctor, I was taught all the things that every emergency doctor needs to know, like how to use a defibrillator, how to repel from a hovering helicopter, and how to stitch someone back together after they've been bitten by a shark. But as a young doctor, no one taught me what I really needed to know, which was how to deal with the emotional hemorrhage I witnessed every day when someone hears bad news about their own health or even worse, about someone they love. One of the places where I learned the most about life and death and my place at the junction between those two was in the intensive care unit at the Prince Charles Hospital where I spent half a year. My boss was a doctor called John McCarthy who was not only a brilliant physician but also the most intuitive doctor I've ever met. He just seemed to be able to walk into a room and make a decision about someone that occasionally seemed off key but always, always turned out to be right. Take, for example, the case of a 40-year-old father of two, a single bee sting, anaphylaxis, cardiovascular collapse, life support, hanging in that precarious place between life and death. I, I honestly thought he would pull through. I mean, he was young, he was fit. I remember Dr McCarthy walking into the room and just standing and observing and then ever so gently checking the man's pulse. Afterwards, he walked out of the room and just shook his head to me, and the man died that night despite everything we did. I watched him afterwards with the man's devastated wife, just deeply, deeply listening to her, and I realised that when people feel listened to, they'll accept the news that you have for them, even when it's bad. He seemed to do this by removing the boundaries between himself as a specialist and his patients and their families and their suffering. We're all human, we all suffer. Anatomically, we're all the same. Physiologically, we're all the same. We're all equally frail and equally vulnerable to death. Later, I also looked after a 50-year-old plumber who had a massive heart attack and was on every kind of life support it's possible to be on. He was waitlisted urgently for a heart transplant and we all knew that if he didn't receive one, he would die within days, if not hours. It seemed hopeless. We'd called in the priest. But Dr McCarthy said to me, Fiona, I think he can hang on. I think it's going to be okay. And that night, a young cyclist had a dreadful accident and he was a brain-dead body with a live heart and a live body with an almost dead heart. There was an exchange of sorts, a gift. And for one, an inevitable death, but for the other, a new life. For six months, I watched and learned from Dr McCarthy, and he taught me to trust my intuition as a doctor. And it helped me become a more tuned in doctor, not just towards diagnosis, but more tuned into my patient's emotional language and importantly, more tuned into myself. Now probably what we think of as intuition really just represents the assimilation of years of experience and knowledge and a heightened awareness of hundreds of tiny sensory signals, like the smell of a patient just before they deteriorate or changes in their heart rate or their skin colour. All of those things make up intuition to us. It's just like listening for that one soft, clear note in a sea of static. And the trick comes for us logical, scientific doctor types in not ignoring those signals when we receive them. Dr McCarthy also taught me not to use the actual word intuition in front of my patients because it kind of freaked them out. <laughs> to to think that their specialist was using nothing more than a gut feeling to make a diagnosis. So I learned to cotton wool around my intuition with facts and research and studies and experience, but it was always there at the core of every decision I made. 
And then five years ago, my intuition took me in a completely different du direction. And I want to tell you a little bit about that because it gave me a different way of seeing the world. Five years ago, I moved to China. My husband, Matt, who's an incredibly talented man and runs a company called Urban Art Projects, won a design competition in Shanghai. Let's move to China, he said. And because I know that life can turn on a dime, and because my gut feeling said to say yes, I said yes. I knew nothing about China, actually. I had never been there. But I went anyway. And China, as many of you know, is an amazing place, but also very challenging. To start with, it's kind of chaotic. And secondly, despite all my knowledge and learning and degrees, I knew nothing there. I was completely illiterate because I didn't speak or understand a word of Chinese. The first Chinese wor word that I learned was Waigurun, which means foreigner. It's literally Chinese for outsider or outside country person. And I seemed to hear it everywhere I went. Wa wi wa 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 Waigurun. Wa wa Waigurun. Wa wi wa wa wa. Wa wa Waigurun. Wa wa. And what I imagined that I was hearing was those foreigners taking over China, those foreigners have got way too much money and they have such strange habits and odd smells. And aren't foreigners so ugly? <laughs> I decided I needed to learn Chinese, so I did, and it was like being given the keys to the kingdom. Suddenly, I could understand everything around me, and what I actually heard was, those lucky Waigurun, haven't they got such beautiful Waigurun children? And aren't they lucky to be allowed to have two children? And hasn't that Waigurun got a beautiful, big nose? <laughs> China was equally challenging for our two children, Bella and Lily, who went to a Chinese international school. And I got some inkling of what that might be like for them to go to a Chinese school when Lily, who was five years old at the time, went on, her, went on her first school excursion to the Shanghai Wild Animal Park. It's this big open park full of lions and tigers and lynxes, and the kids go on a little bus through the park and see the wild animals in their native Shanghai habitat. <laughs> <laughs> and Matt and I were having this very first world parent discussion about the ethics of zoos in general and wild animal parks in particular. When the note came home from school asking, would we like to spend 10 yuan for a frozen chicken or 20 yuan for a live chicken for the five-year-old kids to throw from the window of the bus <laughs> to feed the wild animals? <laughs> and at that point, I knew we were in a place with very different rules. After the excursion, Lily came home and said, Mum, that was great, I got to ride on a bear. And I said... <laughs> I said, like a teddy bear, like in a shopping centre, a plastic bear, and you put your money in and off you go. And she said, no, Mummy, a real bear. And I'm thinking, like a stuffed bear. <laughs> I said, you lucky rode on the back of a stuffed bear. And she said, no, mummy, a real bear, a live bear. And at this point, she could probably sense my complete horror and see the colour draining from my face. And she said to me, don't worry, mummy, it had one of those things over its mouth. <laughs> and I said, what did your teacher say? And Lily said to me, um, she said... She said not to tell you. <laughs> so that was my introduction to school excursions in China, and everything in China for me was kind of like that. Take something familiar, project it into a parallel universe, and kind of warp it on the way through. But gradually, over the next three years, I fell in love with China, with the Chinese people, with their boundless optimism, with their hard-working ethics, with their intense and lovely curiosity about the outside world. And I fell in love with the food. Wow, the food. The, 
the street food, the plump dumplings full of ginger fragrant pork and hot soup that sort of scalded your mouth as you bit into them. And I fell in love with the fresh food, the sweet, green, tender bamboo shoots that just appeared for a few weeks in the market every spring. And because I couldn't work in China as a doctor under Chinese law, I started writing a blog and taking photos <clears throat> just to encounter, just to record the foods that I'd encountered and the places that we'd travelled to. But that little intuitive voice said to me, keep writing and keep taking photos because you don't know where that might go. And one day I caught up with a friend whose kids were being photographed for the Shanghai Parents and Kids magazine and I met the young editor who was this 24-year-old go-getter from New York and she knew a stack about publishing and nothing about kids. And when she heard I was a parent and a blogger, she asked if I'd blog for their website. So I said yes and that was the start of what I like to consider my writing apprenticeship in China. So I blogged for them and then I wrote one or two print articles for their magazine and then the magazine that owned their magazine had one of their columnists leave, the woman who wrote the fortnightly Family Matters column about family life in Shanghai and they asked if I would write that and it was a paid gig. I got one yuan a word, about 15 cents, but it was very exciting for me. And then another magazine asked if I'd be their food columnist and another their travel columnist and then one day CNN emailed me and said, would I write a travel feature for them about China? But as every writer in this room knows, writing pays very poorly, even for CNN, probably especially for CNN. And so in between, I would fly back to Australia to my old work in the emergency room as a doctor. And I began this double life as a writer and a doctor. And very gradually, the boundaries between those two halves of myself seemed to be dissolving and I was restitching myself into someone new, someone creative, someone with an eye and a voice. This year, in fact in this room, I heard the writer Elizabeth Gilbert talking about that one big unique creative idea that's yours and yours alone, whether it's a, an idea for a novel or a piece of art or a poem or a song. And her concept is that the universe is just floating with these big creative creative ideas, and they're just looking for that one person who can bring them into being, who can realise that idea. And her idea is that when this big creative idea taps you on the shoulder, you need to be ready to receive it. So one morning in Shanghai, I'm lying in bed asleep, and this big creative idea, like fully formed, completely realised, hits me awake. And when it wakes me up, I get this sick, excited feeling in my guts and goosebumps up and down my arms. But it's pretty crazy, so I push it away and I push it away and it keeps coming back and coming back. And every time it comes back to me, I get that sick, excited feeling and those goosebumps. So what was it? What was my big creative idea? It was this. It said to me in a very direct voice, Fiona, find a camper van, drive it around China, take six months to do it. Now, that was not what I thought my big creative idea <laughs> was going to be. But I duly received it, and I just kind of opened myself up to the universe and spent the next 12 months trying to make it happen. Partly because not listening to that voice in my head that told me to do it was more frightening than listening to it. Now, I don't know if you guys know very much about camping and camper vanning in China. It is not a thing. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are exactly three camping grounds in China, so that's one for every 450 million people. <laughs> <laughs> and camper vanning is definitely not a thing. Most people have never seen one before, and there are 5,000 more camper vans for every one of you here in Australia than there are in China. So it took six months just to find one of six camper vans for rent in China, <laughs> and another three months to negotiate a price with the lovely Mr Chen, and then another three months for Matt and I to study for and sit our Chinese driver's license test, which was excruciating. And it gradually dawned on me that we might be the first family to circumnavigate China by camper van ever. <laughs> that was quite a frightening thought, though, so we just concentrated on making it happen. 
And we got the van and we filled it up with all the things we thought we'd need, like UHT milk and chocolate and red wine and um, 20 copies of an open letter to village chiefs explaining our non-threatening need to camp near their village for the night. <laughs> and we, we said goodbye to our friends and we strapped ourselves in and off we went. And China opened up for me as this wondrous place of misty mountains and rocky deserts. And running through it all, this tapestry of 55 different ethnic groups other than Han Chinese and 14 different countries along its borders. And it occurred to me that for thousands of years, those ethnic minorities we met, the Yi, the Yao, the Bai, the Dai, the Dong, the Miao, the Mosu, the Hani, the Sunni, the Hui, the Uyghurs, the Tibetans, the Mongols, the Nashi, all of them had been living together in this one place without boundaries as a kind of fluid human tapestry. But I know what you actually want to know is what driving in China was like. So <laughs> let me tell you, those six months were the most difficult, grueling, and at times dangerous of our lives. Sometimes the roads were good, but usually they weren't. And occasionally our campsites were idyllic, but often not. And sometimes we ate like kings, and sometimes like paupers, and sometimes we even ate insects, but the food was always incredibly good everywhere we went. And because China's crowded, we often had company. <laughs> and occasionally, solitude. And sometimes the beauty of the countryside was so transcendent, it took your breath away. And sometimes the polluted ugliness was so profound, it made you want to weep. And we saw many things that were confronting for us to see, but we just kept going, driven by our curiosity and our desire to get home safely. And through it all, I kept writing and kept writing, and those experiences formed the basis of a book manuscript that's actually going next week to the Frankfurt Book Fair to find a publisher. Now, if you had said to the me of five years ago that today I'd be a published writer and photographer and Chinese speaker, I could not have believed you. Medicine taught me to trust my intuition. But China taught me that when we trust our intuition, our life might change in marvelous and unexpected ways. The thought that I'd like to leave with you is really a thought for my two brave and beautiful daughters, Bella and Lily. What if we could live a life without boundaries? What if within our own lives, we refuse to be constrained by our careers or our families or our own expectations of ourselves and instead expected that the boundaries of our lives might be fluid and non-linear and that we could say yes to unexpected possibilities without repercussions. And what if Australia had no boundaries and there was no need to stop the boats? And what if countries had no boundaries and there would be no need for war. And what if our one single human world, in which we are all far more similar than different, had no boundaries? Thank you.